All right, we are starting. What are we starting? Uh, we are starting our series of discussions on deconstruction and pragmatism. And uh, this coming Saturday will be our first group discussion, January 13th. And we're beginning with chapter two. We're skipping over chapter one. And in fact, uh, our last discussion will be about chapter one, which serves as a, an overall commentary on the whole series of exchanges. Chapter two is written by the central thinker in this, um, in this book, Richard Dorty. Um, I think everybody else comes to respond to Rorty's reading of Derrida, Rorty's reading of the deconstruction and the relationship between pragmatism and deconstruction, their similarities um, and uh, their common aims, common sensibilities, according to Rorty. One of the things that makes this volume exciting and interesting and significant at least for me, in my opinion, is the position that it gives to Rorty. If you're like me, your impression of Rorty might be someone who comes in and puts an end, or at least wants us to put an end to a kind of discussion, to a kind of viewpoint. And that is a viewpoint that sees philosophy as very important, very unique, making unique promises. And Rorty comes in and deflates that viewpoint, deflates that kind of excitement and this philosophy's self-regard, regard for itself and its view of its own importance. And the consequences of that might be quietism. But the way this volume specifically is arranged, it reveals how Rorty and Rorty's voice, Rorty's position, can actually be the beginning of a discussion. Rorty is very insightful, and I think those two things being insightful and stimulating, exciting, generating further discussion, those two things could be uh, disentangled and separated from each other. You know, if I've met many teachers who were not the most insightful, they were not the most clever, you know, they didn't have penetrating intelligence and insights, but they were very stimulating, they generate, they were very good at generating discussions in the group, in the classroom. And the contrast is also possible somebody might be very insightful but not stimulating they they might have this kind of master discourse attitude that wants everybody to be quiet and just accept their viewpoint so i think uh, we are doing service to rorty by putting him at the very beginning and showing how he could be criticized extended revised challenged okay so let's uh let's begin i'm going to read a selection of passages from uh, Rorty's text and kind of invite a way of getting into the discussion with the central distinction, the, cent the distinction at the center of Rorty's text, which is this private public distinction and its relationship to philosophy. How does Rorty begin? He begins by talking about misreadings of Derrida. Misreadings of Derrida both by the right and left. So we read that Derrida is read by conservative know-nothings in the United States and Britain as a frivolous and cynical despiser of common sense and traditional democratic values. Many of my colleagues in the Anglophone philosophical community support this reading and attempt to excommunicate Derrida from the philosophical profession. On the other hand, Derrida is read by his fans in American departments of literature as the philosopher who has transformed our notions of language and the self. They think of him as having demonstrated the truth of certain important propositions, propositions the recognition of which undermines our traditional ways of understanding ourselves and understanding the books we read. They also take him to have given us a method, the deconstructive method of reading texts a method which helps us see what these texts are really about, what is really going on in them. Then he goes on to say, I find both these ways of reading Derrida equally dubious. Okay, so what is Rorty's own reading of Derrida? How does he think we should read him? He thinks we should read him as a playful thinker, as someone who doesn't want to necessarily have an immediate impact on our social and political lives. So we read, 
When in the past I've described Derrida as playful, this has sometimes been read as a dismissive epithet, suggesting that there is something lightweight about him. But I would use the same adjective of Plato and Nietzsche, and in the same sense, there's a difference between play in the approbative sense in which Schiller used it to say, for example, that man is fully human only when he plays, and what the know-nothings mean by frivolity. So the impact of this play, this playful attitude, this playful work, is indirect in our social political lives, in the public life. And it is through cultivating uh, a romantic imagination, which for Rorty is at the core of humanism. So he writes, humanism can mean a certain platonic Cartesian Kantian account of what it is to be human but it can also mean participation in the hopes of the Enlightenment, and specifically the hope that human beings, once they have set God and the various surrogates for God to one side, may learn to rely on their own romantic imagination and their own ability to cooperate with each other for the common good. In this latter sense, Derrida seems to me as good a humanist as Mill or Dewey. Then he turns to pragmatism and briefly unpacks that, especially in relation to deconstruction and its sensibilities. He writes, Pragmatism starts out from Darwinian naturalism, from a picture of human beings as chance products of evolution. This starting point leads pragmatists to be as suspicious of the great binary oppositions of Western metaphysics as are Heidegger and Derrida. Darwinians share Nietzschean suspicions of platonic otherworldliness and the Nietzschean conviction that distinctions like mind versus body and objective versus subjective need to be reformulated in order to cleanse them of platonic presuppositions and give them a firmly naturalistic sense. Then, uh, regarding language, he writes, when it comes to language, pragmatists see the later Wittgenstein, Quine, and Davidson as having got rid of the dualistic Frigian ways of thinking which dominated the Tractatus Logical Philosophicus and early analytic philosophy. They read Derrida on language as making pretty much the same criticisms of the Cartesian, Lockean, Husserlian view of language as the expression of thought, which Wittgenstein made in his philosophical investigations. They read both Derrida and Wittgenstein not as having discovered the essential nature of language or of anything else, but simply as having helped get rid of a misleading and useless picture. Then we get to the heart of this article, where he writes, In my own writing about Derrida, I have urged that we see him as sharing Dewey's utopian hopes, but not treat his work as contributing in any clear or direct way to the realization of those hopes. I divide philosophers rather crudely into those like Mill, Dewey, Rawls, whose work fulfills primarily public purposes, and those whose work fulfills primarily private purposes. I think of the Nietzsche, Heidegger, Derrida assault on metaphysics as producing private satisfactions to people who are deeply involved with philosophy, and therefore necessarily with metaphysics, but not as politically consequential, except in a very indirect and long-term way. Then he writes, con contrasting Derrida's earlier and later works. He writes, Derrida's earlier, less idiosyncratic, more strictly philosophical work, and in particular his books on Husserl, were necessary to get him a hearing, necessary to establish himself and get himself published. But, although I find these works very valuable, I read them as books in which Derrida works out his private relationships to the figures who have meant most to him. I prefer texts like Envoys and Sir Confession because these seem to me more vivid and forceful forms of private self-creation than is possible through the explication of texts, even when these, uh, this explication is exceptionally brilliant and original. So Rorty here is staying with his a public-private distinction, and saying that Derrida, even in his uh, more strictly earlier, more strictly philosophical works, his concerns were primarily private, and his style, 
was aimed towards a private, uh, the private set of concerns. But they were not fully formed. The, his style, Derrida's style, becomes fully formed, becomes, uh, uh, takes its own original form in later works. It becomes uh, most what it is. It turns into what it is the most in works like Envoys and Sir Confessions. Simon Critchley, uh, this passage I'm going to read now is a clarification by Simon Critchley about what Rorty means uh, with the distinction public and private. So here, this passage is from Critchley, quote, It is important to point out that Rorty's private-public distinction is not the Hellenistic or Arentian demarcation of oikos and polis between the domestic hearth and the public forum. The private is defined by Rorty as being concerned with idiosyncratic projects of self-overcoming, with self-creation, and the pursuit of autonomy. The public is defined as being concerned with those activities having to do with the suffering of other human beings, with the attempt to minimize cruelty and work for social justice. End quote. Okay, now let's get back to uh, Rorty's chapter. Again, regarding mundane politic, uh, political activities, the mundane domain of politics that doesn't require idiosyncratic experimental language, you know, original, original work with language, and philosophy, which can be a place for a more playful uh, treatment of language. So we are reading Rorty here again. Um, I see ethics and politics, real politics as opposed to cultural politics, as a matter of reaching accommodation between competing interests and as something to be deliberated about in banal, familiar terms, terms which do not need philosophical dissection and do not have philosophical presuppositions. When Dewey talked politics as opposed to doing philosophy, he offered advice about how to avoid getting hung up on traditional ways of doing things, how to re-describe the situation in terms which might facilitate compromise, and how to take fairly small reformist steps. He goes on to say, I do not see texts such as the politics of friendship as contributions to political thought. Politics, as I see it, is a matter of pragmatic, short-term reforms and compromises, compromises which must, in a democratic society, be proposed and defended in terms much less esoteric than those in which we overcome the metaphysics of presence, referring to Derrida's deconstruction of the metaphysics of presence. Political thought centers on the attempt to formulate some hypotheses about how and under what conditions such reforms might be affected. I want to save radicalism and pathos for private moments and stay reformist and pragmatic when it comes to my dealings with other people. Okay, so this is, I think, a very compelling uh, distinction and he justifies it very effectively, I think. So we are now in a position to both appreciate the public-private distinction, its relationship to deconstruction, pragmatism, and philosophy more generally, the task of philosophy, and its relationship to politics that is, uh, in Rorty's view, long-term and indirect. And we are also ready for uh, a criticism of this uh, distinction, if you will, a deconstruction of it. <laughs> so um, the, the following parts, so I'm going to continue talking about this book. The next one will be on Critchley and Rorty's response to Critchley. And then I'll do the same thing with Laclau. And then I'll make a video about Derrida's contribution. But all of those will be for uh, Patreon supporters. And um, we will also record our group discussions, which also will be on, uh, available on Patreon only. But I think this video, I'm going to make it available on, um, on the public YouTube channel as an invitation um, if anybody else is interested in joining us. Um, again, the first session will be this coming Saturday, January 13th. It's totally okay to join us a little bit later in the middle. As I said, all the discussions are recorded and available for Patreon supporters. Thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to our group discussions. Bye for now.